Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you've all had a safe trip and um, nice to be able to come here and relax a little bit and do some learning and, and we'll just see where it goes. So I'd, I'd like to start with prayer. Dear Father, I want to thank you so much for your love and for this beautiful setting where we're at to do learning. And um, and I just ask that you will be with us, that um, you will guide our, our words here as we do this presentation, that it will fit the needs and, um, and that you will be with us as uh, during this meeting. Amen. Okay, so I, my name is Judy Johnson. And I grew up in Los Angeles, um, and I just had always had this dream to marry a farmer, but I never thought that would really ever come to fruition because I lived in a city. Um, but it did happen. The Lord blessed me. So I've been married to Brad for 40 years, and he's been farming a little longer than that, but I've been involved in the farm for 40 years, and Brad has always farmed organically. And so to preface this, I would just like to say that when Brad started farming organically, um, he just went and told his marketers, this is what I do, you know, so you know how my food is grown, and they'd buy his product. And maybe, maybe you'd like to just give a preface of how, how that worked for you. So... so uh... Uh, I'm kind of a newcomer here in, in terms of my presentation. Pr presentation. So she said, why don't you help me stand in here a little bit to help, you know, talk about some of the, what she's, she's uh, doing to kind of add to it. So that's why I'm kind of standing up here too. But, um, so yeah, the, you wanted me to kind of talk a little bit more. Well, about just, just preface this with how you started and then it went to the, just going to each grower to grower and then how it went. Okay, so yeah, so we, when in the 70s, when I first started organics, I, I just, that's how I started farming. That was 75 when I grew my first crop of tomatoes. And we just wrote up a little sheet that said, this is what we're doing. And we went to, direct to our people that are buying from us. Here's how we grow our we're growing practices and what we do. And that was good enough. And it's actually still good enough, in my opinion. But since then, we went to, um, grower to grower certification because we need some verification of how things were done integrity in the business that kind of thing i kind of went kicking and screaming i don't want to do all this stuff you know because i'm happy where i am but then we had to get into we went grower so we were grower certifying we wouldn't certify somebody who had a, um, a conflicting crop so if somebody grew prune we wouldn't certify them because then we were conflicting with their practices or whatever in terms of knowing what they were doing but then we Welcome, welcome. Um, so then, then we um, we went to that from that to forming in California CCOF, which is California Certified Organic Farmers, and there's other agencies, multitudes. I don't know who they are anymore. I and think that's Judy, like on the slide here. There, there's like 80 so, different agencies. So so there's a whole bunch of slew of things. Now we're CCOF. We've been there since what? number 10 on the books that they've got or something as far as certifying with them. Um, but that was kind of a, and then we, you know, then we went, that then the state got involved. So the state got into it. California, we had the CDFA number we had to put on our label. And then pretty soon we got the federal, we went to the federal government and the federal USDA is involved. So USDA is then one further step beyond that. And then, of course, international certification agencies and all that. So it's gone from, you know, 40, 50 years ago to simple things, and now it's bigger and it's more involved. And so that's kind of what we're getting into a little bit here, what that, what involvement is. Yeah, so so I thought that might be kind of an interesting preface. Um, now, if as I'm presenting, what's involved today to, to be able to claim that your product is certified organic as you're selling your product? So, what does it need to be certified organic? So, as you can see here, organic certification requires that farmers and handlers document their processes and get inspected every year. So, it's an every year deal. 
Organic on-site inspections account for every component of your operation, and that's including but not limited to your seed sources, your soil conditions, crop health, weed and pest management, water systems, inputs, contamination and commingling risks, and prevention, record keeping, Tracing the organic products from start to finish is a part of the USDA organic promise. So that's what you're promising when you sell your product. So it's very all-encompassing. It's basically you're documenting how you're farming is what you're doing. And this is a copy um, of our recertification as of October of 2021, and it's good till next October of 2021. And a lot of times you'll find if, I mean 2022, if, if, if you're selling to markets and, you know, and, and it's expired, you'll probably get an email, hey, I need an updated certification. They cannot buy your product if you claim to sell that way without your certification uh, physically with them also. And, and we, we also get other agencies asking for a certification if they're buying our product or they're processing our product or something. Yeah, like for instance, you know, we grow prunes and, and we have to take them to a dehydrator and, and they are also certified as processing the prunes organically. And so then um, we have to give them a copy of our certification as well. So it runs through the whole system of however your product, whatever it is involved in, uh, they, they need a copy of your certification, verification. Can I just ask a question? Sure. Yeah. Crop health, um, that involves, you know, how are you taking care of your growing practices? You know, um, what's your soil like that will produce crops that are healthy? You know, what is your pest management? Um, Brad, do you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, that's a huge, you know. Yeah, because it lists them separately, so that's why I want to, what makes it different from... I am going to go a little bit into, okay. these are kind of, you know, as I'll be reading, there's five steps, and it's basically taking care, you know, of your soils, your water runoff, your, you know, the big word now, biodiversity, is kind of what it's all yeah, entailing. Okay. okay. So organic foods are grown and processed by federal guidelines. So that's where we've come from his hey, this is how I grow my stuff, to now we have all these guidelines that we have to follow if we want to claim this. And they address your soil quality, animal raising practices, pest and weed control, the use of additives or any applications, and certified producers use natural substances for all their farming methods. So if you're thinking, okay, I want to grow organically and I've just got this piece of ground, um, to be able to certify your ground, you have, you have to prove and not have anything on it for three years that would um, not be approved for organic growing. Like, a, you know, it could even be, unfortunately, a runoff of uh, contaminated water. It could be... Um, someone next to you that's sprayed and the chemicals have blown over on the property, you know, it, uh, all those things have to be taken into consideration and we'll go into more a little bit later of things you can do to prevent those kinds of things from happening. So. Okay, another thing that's required is, um, now this is interesting to me, it's not 100%, but it's a 95%. Um, like if you're processing of uh, what's involved, but it's, it, you know, the things that the, the other 5% is not necessarily your product as much as if you're processing something and you've got cornstarch in it or, you know, something like that. But it also does have to be approved. Um, there's a list you, at the NOP, there's a, a, a list of everything that is approved that you can or cannot use to put with your product. So here, like I was talking about, um, to be organically certified, it's a five-step process. Um, so this, this is um, 
you know, I wish you could see this better. It's not very big, and I kind of need to see it myself. Um, I can probably kind of see it here. But um, can you help me see it, Brad? <laughs> because now I've got this setup mode that I, I can't even really see it. But, but basically, when you're going to have an inspection. Yeah, yeah this part here. Okay. Yeah. Basically, when you're going to have an, expect, uh, an, expect, uh, an inspection, um, now it's all more emails. You're not going to get physical letters like this. But this is a letter. And this is they're going to send this out a little bit before you're going to have an inspection. And this is basically, they're telling you everything here that you need to <clears throat> have ready and be able, that you've had document, that you have ready available um, in the inspection process for to be approved to be certified. So I wish I could see some of them. So I did. You're saying... Uh so, so first you have to have an OSP plan, and I think we might go into that a review little bit update, later. Review and update your organic system plans. Um, so basically what that was is like where Brad was talking about, he just told people, you know, how he farmed and everything. Basically, you're documenting how you're farming. And, and as we talked about, there's five steps here. And I've got them listed somewhere, but right here. But you're addressing your soils. You're addressing, um, you know, everything that you're doing. And so your OSB plan is now documenting that, you know, I used this for my pest control. You know, I, I brought in you know, insects that feed on the bad insects. And all of that kind of thing has to be documented. You documented how you ordered your seed. You know, did you look for organic seed? Or is it non-GMO? And is that documented? Um, you talked about, um, you know, how you're going to prevent contamination from other farmers or water sources and things like that. So that's what your OSP basically is, is how, how are you running your farm and you're needing to document that. And it has to be done in a way that will meet the certifier's requirements. So does organic mean then non-GMO? Yes. Does that imply that then? Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. In fact, in, in CCUF, it, it, they have a label that we have for them to use. Uh, basically, it says that organic is non-GMO. Yeah, so <clears throat> so you've gone through your OSP plan, okay, and um, then you have your an appointment with an inspector, and they come and they visit your farm, and not only does it entail how you're farming outside, it entails all your record keeping. So they're going to want to look at your financials. They want to know how much you made. They want to know. Um, yields off of your crops because they want to make sure you're not buying non-organic product and including it with yours and selling it. So everything has to tie together. Your money, you know, how much would a crop like that, you know, how much should you earn for that, um, buy for how much you're growing, all those kinds of things. So, so your inspector comes and then, so you kind of have an office inspection of all that. Yeah, and one thing I have in our case, sometimes you're educating the inspector. <laughs> they don't always know what's what or what a crop will produce. And so they're not fully educated in all these aspects either. So you have to be aware that we're dealing with both sides of this thing and sometimes even how, how to grow organic. Because they're not necessarily farmers. So that you're, you're actually educating them in a lot of cases. Yes, it has to be done every year. <clears throat> um, let's see. And so then, you know, you kind of do your in-house inspection, and then you go outside, and they're going to look at all these different things, you know, what's your ground look like, and they'll, you know, if there's any changes. Now, I think you can have an inspector, the same inspector, for three years, 
after you're the third year, they send in a different inspector because you don't want to get the buddy thing going and they're just going to pass your stuff on kind of thing. They're kind of trying to keep that from happening. So um, it's kind of easier after the first year because you're not educating them really so much about what you're really doing. They kind of already know. So it'll go a lot faster, and that's another thing. The more ready you are, because not only do you pay for your certification, but you pay for the inspector to come certify you. So if you're not very ready and there's six hours, that's six hours of a lot of money. So, um, so, so going outside, Brad, help me out there. When, when they inspect outside, what are, what are, they're basically looking at your farming practices. Yeah, there. so it's not just a... Uh, Inspection doesn't entail just the paperwork, but we do a, a farm tour. So we'll just go and we'll take a look at all our borders. And uh, in that opportunity, we have an opportunity. They'll check for how we're controlling our weeds, and we can talk about different things that are going on in the farm. That just gives them a general idea of not just the paperwork, but how things are looking. You know, because if you're putting down a pre-emergent herbicide and everything's just... Now, my here's the interesting thing. My inspector... Because I do a really good job on weed control in some cases, she I had to really emphasize and show her what I was doing because we have some clean ground in some cases. And it looks in some cases that we're, we're using a, a pre-emergent or herbicide of some kind, but it isn't. We use a flamer, and we use it at certain times, and it, it, it can clean the weeds. And so those are things we have to kind of work with the inspector on. So we just do a, a border check, and that, in that process, we have an opportunity to talk to them about some of our processes and stuff like that. So that's important because you want to have build that rapport, you know, and you want to have an inspector that's willing to kind of consider where you are. Sometimes they might come in and they're, I, I tell my story about the inspector wearing a badge. <laughs> no, <laughs> maybe not. If you want. So, yeah, so anyway, I, I won't maybe get into that later. But so anyway, that's just part of the process, doing the field check too. And, and I don't know all the details of that. I'm trying to remember, but. So we're using, yeah, so you you can use, there are certain things, you, you know, that's burning. So I use a propane burner, okay. and it just, it, it'll it kill weeds, you know, with fire. There's also chemical burning in organics that are usable now. So we started when these products weren't available. The, of course, fire was available, but, you know, some of these newer things that we're using now, so they might be looking through all the documentation of our products, but that would also be like suppress is one of them, if I was to name one. That's a weed control deal. It's an acid, and but it's approved by by organic, so you can burn weeds with a with a with an acid, and you know that kind of stuff. So so th th I had to kind of explain some of those processes to them what we're doing because they don't know everything either. You know they should maybe some degree, but you talk about farming and inspecting all kinds of different farms. That's a huge deal, you know. You know, and in regard to the money, uh, a lot of times, you know, we we grow prunes. So prunes is a three-to-one dry weight. So you might have a fresh uh, weight, but we generally work off of a dried weight. All of our calculations are done on dried tons. So they don't know that. So we get our we get, so you go to the dryer and, and you're saying, well, we grew this many tons. Well, really, it's a it's a three-to-one uh, dry weight. So we have to just kind of explain how our tonnage works and how our markets are and some of our we crops. Show our tag. We show our green weight. We yeah. Show our dry so our weight. delivery weights are, are, and then our dry weights after it gets out of the hydrator, and then we we go to what what we sold because it's got to compare all the way through what we deliver to the dryer, what we deliver to the to be pitted, and then what we sold. So it's all kind of tracked all the way through the process. Yeah. Yeah, and just a note on your on your chemical weeding. The important thing with that is it, it doesn't work like your Roundup if you've got big already weeds. It's something you want to take care of from the small. Yeah, so you're going to talk about that some, at some, was that this one or later? I think that might be more of an adverse, it might be this one, I don't know if this one was. So you've got, then you, you got still <laughs> having your inspection report reviewed. Yeah, so, so then that's all over, and then they go back, and then you do the waiting game, and and, and I find many years, it, it's not really been a problem, but sometimes the appointment that they make with you and your certification running out and getting you a new one doesn't always coincide. So it can be a little tricky sometimes. But 
Anyway, um, so they leave and they do a report and they send it into the agency and then that has to be approved by CDFA at least and or whatever state you're you live in and um, and then uh, they may say hmm you know everything looks good except I found this you know an example of that might be uh, that and I didn't mention that any kind of applications you put on are you wherever you store them or keep them they're gonna look at how you stored them um, they're gonna see what's in there they're gonna read the labels in there they want to make sure there's nothing in there that's not approved to use and so an example is um, we had something that was approved and then got off the approval list because not that it wasn't organic but the company didn't want to share their ingredients because of proprietary reasons and so because they couldn't validate the ingredients in the product they could not put it on the, the on the list and so um, that was a correction it was not that we couldn't finish using that product but we couldn't buy it anymore but say they're saying you get you just can't use this anymore so you know whatever correction they give you they want to verify that that's correct and so they might come back to you and say you know everything looks good except this one area we need you to correct this uh, document send back to us what you've corrected and then after that then they'll send you a certification and you're approved yeah one area might be signage you're supposed to post signage on your property on your borders what where the organic areas are so if you don't have your signs up that might be you know so I usually what I do is I before our inspection even though it's supposed to be up all the time, I go all my, I do that. I do that on my own ahead of time. I say, well, I better check everything, make sure everything looks good and how my signs are up. Because they might come back and say, hey, you didn't have signage up. And so then we got to just send back the pictures or documentation that we got all that taken care of and then, then we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. So you're hoping that you're correcting <coughs> something like that and not a big problem like we found some runoff of some neighbor's flooded water. Then you're out three weeks. Oh, yeah. So then you get your thing. So okay, and and I don't know, you know, every state how that goes. I'm just, you know, we live in California. Not only um, do you have to be certified with your agency, but and approved by the the USDA or CDFA, whatever state certification you have. But you also have to register yourself with the state, which is also another fee. <laughs> and they want to know the same thing. They want to know what you grow and you, and you have to answer a question on that. It's kind of a, it's not like an inspection, but they'll check it against, you know, they need, got access to your certification uh, information. Well, I just thought it was sharing. So that's something to consider if you're thinking of being certified also. Okay, now one of the areas that we kind of mentioned was seed. So how do you handle seed if you want to be certified organic? So there's a process. You um, Now it would be email. Before we would send letters or we would fax to um, three different seed companies or a variety, but at least three. And you have to ask them, you know, you kind of make a list, as you can see here, of, of what. No, you can't. How come that, oh, that's the next slide, sorry. Anyway, you have to make a list and um, find if it's, um, if they have that available in organic seed. And if they do, that's their preference that you buy that organic seed. Sometimes it's, you know, you've had experience with seeds and, you know, you're looking for production and you've tried an organic seed and it doesn't work as well. Um, and, and you state, you know, I use this because, but beyond that, um, of using the organic seed, so um, it, if it's not organic, then it has to be verified that it's non-GMO. Yeah, so what we'll try to do is, I've got certain varieties I like to grow. They produce well. There's an eggplant, some zucchini that are really good. But they don't have an organic, I can't get an organic seed for that. So even though I could grow a different zucchini, I can still get that use that as long as it's not treated in non-GMO and I might then experiment with other varieties along the way that are organic that I can maybe introduce into the market 
but I can still grow those ones that aren't necessarily organically grown. I don't know if that's. Yeah, they they just have to be verified that they're not non GM. I mean that they're non GMO. And so here, here's an example of a letter we used to send out. Now we do it by email. But, and then we just kind of, we have a little spreadsheet. And these are our uh, uh, seed companies that we do a lot of our ordering from for our seed. And then we mark, are they organic, yes or no? Are they non-GMO? Do they have a you know, some kind of way of providing. You, you have to have some documentation by them if they're not organic and that they are non-GMO, that they are non-GMO. So everything is about record keeping with this process. Okay, so here's the example from Johnny Seeds where they have a pledge there that um, anything knowingly that they produce or buy or sell is non-GMO. So that would be something that you would need to have your, with your seed records as they're checking those, those, uh, that out. And they're going to check also your invoicing, you know, the whole process. Everything's a whole process. So it's the seed you buy and it's the invoices and see how that matches. And also the Verifying it's non-GMO. Okay. So now we'll get a little bit into to the areas um, of your soil and fertility and things like that. So organic certification is intended to assure consumers that a product marketed as organic was produced according to the organic production. Organic farming is farming that makes healthy foods, soils, plants, and environments a, pri a priority as well as crop productivity. It supports farm biodiversity. biodiversity. <laughs> Organic production does not use genetically modified seeds or synthetic pesticides or fertilizers. All right, so... Um, Soil fertility. Crops more readily resist disease, drought, and tolerate insects when they are grown in good soil. Builds good soil quality and using cover crops protects the soil from wind and erosion. So, um, so that's kind of, I don't know, are you all familiar with the biodiversity yeah. word? <laughs> So, so Me, I mean, I am, so, but. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. In fact, <laughs> I'd like to kind of hear you. We, we'd like to kind of keep this, you know, whatever is going on in your mind, you know, you want to share that you that, that pertains to this. But you're like me. I'm the same way. So I'm growing up, growing. I'm growing organically. Pretty soon this new generation says they come up with this. So we, we, we're doing non We're just doing stuff. And so then they come up with this idea, oh, we need to know what your biodiversity is. And I, I understand it in that you, you, you want to know what's going on in the farm. It's not just a chemical farm. You want to see that system working to be organic. So my daughter comes to me and she says, Dad, they wanted biodiversity. Know what your biodiversity is. And I'm going, what? What is that? <laughs> so now we not just have to, we have to explain it. So even though with all these things are happening, and that's part of the inspection, is they want to see that diversity happening. It's not just a following the rules. They want to see everything. That's part of the organic process. So I have to document now what I do in, in what's happening on the farm, whether it be the, what the night crawlers and the, and the interaction between my bats and my calling moth and, and my uh, runoff with my I'm, – I'm putting um, most strips out for – now, this isn't – uh, uh, for, to keep the runoff erosion from going into the ditches, and that's normal in my process. But I have to tell them what's normal. Yeah. And well, so, biodiversity. so biodiversity becomes then a whole process of what's going on my farm. So I, I sat down and I wrote about all the aspects, and that's part of my plan now, my OSP, Organic System Plan, and that's included. And, of course, the inspector comes out and he reads what it is. He says, so he gets it. He says, oh, wow. 
that's great, but he didn't see it before. But I see it all day, all year. So then you're just telling him, hey, what's what's going on in my farm? This is diverse. I've got bats. I've got swallows. I've got toads. I've got lizards. I've got spiders. I've got all that stuff that normally would be killed by a pyrethroid. Because if I went out and sprayed with a, uh, a sauna or something like that, spiders are gone. You know, that kind of stuff. Toads, fish, you know, they're... And so this shows that you're following these processes, not just writing them down. Yeah. 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 And so here's just a picture of, you know, a cover crop in the, in the orchard. Um, that's just one. Yeah. Yeah, so we... Part of it. We, we, we do cover crops uh, as part of a process. And it's, it's a mix. You know, nothing's perfect, but we, we try to, you know, do a lot of this stuff. So this cover crop would be just cropping in between the different... Well, it can be... A variety of things, but usually it's something that also is feeding the soil nitrogen. It's also preventing soil erosion. If it's windy and your soil is blowing away, there's a lot of, and this is all under biodiversity. Yeah, so, so. Our, our cover crop in this case, this is a, a, a perennial clover. But we also use an annual clover in our walnuts because we don't want the vegetation to continue to grow at harvest time. Because we harvest, we shake the walnuts on the ground and we need to be able to pick them up without all the growth. So we, we get to harvest it in the walnuts and we've got a pretty clean soil. But in our prunes, this is good. So we use an annual, a perennial clover, which keeps growing all the time. The annual clover dies out in the summer and reseeds itself. So that's just some of the stuff we use. Okay, another thing is crop rotation. That is something they actually ask you about. And, you know, it doesn't, I don't know for us, I don't know what that means for you, but, um, you know, now our, our fresh produce, we have a very small area. Uh, we've kind of put in a more orchard for a lot of reasons. Um, but it's just not planting the same thing in the same place every year, but rotating those crops through. And then Brad has a little explanation, even with an orchard, you know, if he's going to replant the orchard. Yeah, so, because you're not rotating prunes every year. you got a 30-year product or walnuts, a 50-year growth. So our cover crops are part of that in the field. But also, if I'm taking an orchard out, I'll rotate out of, uh, of that orchard into, like, a, a wheat or a safflower or a, a hay crop or maybe even go back to vegetable production for a few years, and then I'll go back into an orchard crop. And that just helps. For me, it's we have certain soil pests that, that uh, grow in the orchard that we're trying to reduce before we put another tree crop back in. Some people just, I've seen them go back right to trees right away, but I like to rotate out of that into another crop before I go back into orchard again. Yeah. And, so it might be maybe years before I'll put a different crop in. But that's part of my purpose. So I'll just tell them that's what we do. You know, how are you going to rotate? You know, when we're doing inspection. Obviously, that's a well, duh. You know, <laughs> we're not going to put your orchard out every year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, it and that was one thing he mentioned is it intersect intercepts uh, insect life cycles or other other things that are kind of prone to like a prune tree or a walnut tree. You know, what's in the ground there? That gives that a chance to kind of be gone and um, and take care of your insect yeah, problems. You've got nematodes, you've got bacteria yeah. that give you trouble. So that kind of goes with suppressing soil-borne and plant diseases, prevents soil erosion, as I talked to you, told you, your, your soil's not blowing away in the winds. Um, it builds organic matter. It's a good nitrogen source. And as we mentioned, it increases your biodiversity. So how do you manage pests? So um, that's part of your system. And prevention is the first line of defense against pests and weeds. Um, you can use predatory insects. You can manually remove them. Um, and then you can use organic certified approved pesticides that are natural, such as microorganisms and pesticide derived from plants. So I'm going to have Brad share just a little bit of his little insect and 
all that kind of stuff that goes on for pests that are place. It's also um, certain flowers and things that attract bad insects to them, or good insects. Yeah, I'm trying to think of where to go with this. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, over the years, we've tried different things, of course. We've, t we've re released insects like lacewing eggs, and we go up into the hills and harvest uh, ladybugs and bring them down to the valley and release them. You know, that would be, just to explain that a little bit, we, we go up in camp and we find the ladybug uh, swarms in the mountains, and then we would uh, bring them back in an ice chest, put them in our cooler, and release them at night in the fields to try to get them to stay. You know, in order to get them to stay, they would, we don't want them flying back to the mountains, so we'd go, go get like a soda pop or a sugar water, and we'd spray it on their wings and, and try to get them to stick, their wings to stick to their body at night, so they crawl in the tree and then acclimate, because we had aphids, aphids would be a problem. So there, we want them to stay and lay eggs and produce uh, larvae and, and eat the, and so that's just, that's one aspect. So we're t talking about that, we're talking about biodiversity again kind of thing. And weeds, you know, uh, same thing, you know, you know, we're just, you know, you want to cultivate your weeds early, don't let them get big. I don't know if that's following along the line of what you're talking about. Wasps are huge, you know, trichogamma wasps, parasitized aphids, and so that's part of the, what's going on for our pest control. Uh, it's multitude. I mean, I, all, every crop we have has its, its unique needs of, of, uh, of pest and control. Yeah, go ahead. Have you noticed the difference actually catching and releasing uh, those insects on your other crop? You know, the university did some studies on our place, and they brought wasps for aphids. Now, they were doing very scientific releasing. I don't know. I'd have to look back on their stuff. And that was, they, they would wrap the, the leaves from, you know, they would, I don't know, it was amazing, whatever they did. But So they were releasing a wasp. Now, we have since, I don't know, I'm, guess, I'm, I'm wondering if that's where that's originated. We have since had a lot of benefit from trichogramma wasps and wasps, even in our greenhouses with, the little brassica uh, aphid, which is different than every aphid is different too. It's incredible. You got your all these different types. This is a medley plum aphid. You got your leaf curl aphid. You got your uh, uh, walnut aphid. You got you got and it's each one sometimes have this different dynamic of what it likes. So these wasps can go right to where they are, versus trying to spray it and hit it and try to kill it that way. So yeah, I think in that case, yes. In terms of we released uh, lace big wig wing eggs for years in our vegetables, I sometimes thought we were just planting an ant food, right. you know, because ants <laughs> like to eat the eggs. But they, they, they uh, naturally, they'll, they'll lay their eggs on a little uh, web up off the plant, you know, what, half an inch off. That's for predatory. So I think naturally they're there now, and um, so they provide us a big benefit. Uh, ladybugs, we have a lot of ladybugs, and uh, so that's, you know, that just shows you know, come back to that biodiversity thing, you know, <laughs> what we're doing and what that is working. And so, yes, I guess the answer is, the uh, long answer is that. And yes, it's, I think it's a big bit of that. I don't know if I could scientifically prove it, except visually we see it happen. Well, and, and another example is, is we built bat houses. And so we have bats that come in during the summertime and fall until it gets cold, and then they'll come back every season. And some actually stay, but we have some apple trees too. And we definitely, we'd always had trouble with worms. Well, they're night flyers, and, and we had beautiful apples. Yeah. So the calling moth flies at night, and, they, and we, our idea is they feed on those. Uh, we have, I don't know, our bat population is, we have, we've, put, we've got about six <laughs> houses out, each house. Don't go out at dusk. <laughs> yeah. Six to 1,200 bats in a house is potentially that much. And uh, then they're, they, or, yeah, they're, they're kind of a nuisance in some ways, but. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty ominous to go out about sunset. Don't tell the police either. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they'll, you know, they're all coming out to do their, their night work. I believe so. Uh, I kind of 
we'll talk about, about this personally myself in another presentation, but because I'm kind of, I'm putting in some of my stuff that I'm doing later. Uh, yes, we've seen, and I'm not sure if I understand it, because we do try to work heavily with our soil balancing, and and uh, 2018 we had a real heavy aphid infestation, and we could not control it to any good degree with all the stuff we tried, and so I tried to review my practices and those kind of things. But the the, the thing is that the other uh, farmers were having the same trouble, so that made me think it's not just me, it's not my practices. And I, since then, we changed our practices to go to a, more, a better system. We, we think we were missing some things that year. And so we went back, and I haven't had any trouble since. I don't, so exactly to tell you for sure, you know, I don't know. But we, we, some things don't crop up, and you think, oh, man, what's going on now? I think, I think the environment, I think the weather, I think there's all kinds of things. You know, when it's been a certain high temperature or a low temperature or wet or dry, you know, I think all those at certain times definitely play a role in that too. Okay. Um, uh, we got about 15 minutes, I think. So, okay. So then they, they um, are, they're going to want to inspect um, what are you doing to preserve the integrity of your farm. And we kind of touched on this, but this is a picture of a hedgerow. This is our walnuts. And, and we planted, what do you call these things? Italian <laughs> so, so we have a, a farmer that farms walnuts on the other side of this hedge that is not organic. So we have to protect our stuff from his, you know, from his stuff. So this is an example of, um, of a hedgerow where we're um, protecting our, uh, the runoff from somebody else, a yeah, drift or whatever. Yeah, drift or, or yeah. neighbor intrusion, <laughs> those kind of things. Yeah, this particular neighbor is not, we get along, and son, the sons have taken over his business since, but that's not just a uh, organic barrier. <laughs> that's, that's, there, there was some intrusion that was causing me trouble that, he would just, he would drift, he would drive through and he would drift his herbicide boom on my, coming across the road, and so it would drift. So I just kind of say, hey, you know, I love you, but just leave your stuff on your side, you know. Because <laughs> then we can't farm it organically anymore. So, and then here's the signs he was telling you about, that you need to post signs everywhere you're growing, that sh so people are aware, you know, and will respect that, you hope. Okay, so this is a slide that's just kind of showing you of the meaning of the 95% or, or your labels you can use. So products must be a minimum of 95% if you're going to use a USDA organic label on any kind of packaging that you're going to do or claim even at a farmer's market if you're going to put a little label that you're organic, you know, it, it's, it's got to go by by that much there, at least 95%. And so there's different levels here you can see. Now, if, if you're not certified, you cannot claim, even though you're practicing everything to all the rules and regulations, if, you're, if you don't have that certification, you cannot claim that you're, you're a certified organic farmer. But you can say, I grow, I, I grow these organically. Or if you have a product with ingredients or things like that, you can say, I used organic ingredients to make this product. But you can't claim to be certified uh, under 95%. And then there's the different levels here um, that it talks about of kind of the regulations of, of what you can say and what you can post and all that kind of stuff. Um, so any labeling you use um, needs to be approved by your organic certifiers. So you can't just say, oh, I want to sell my prunes and bag them like this. Because <laughs> we started an online store, so um, you know, we'll, we'll mail these out. But we, we made this, and then, of course, we put the ingredients and everything on the back. But we had to send it to CCOF, and they had to approve it before we could sell with our label on it. So that's an example of that. Um, each label for each commodity, even only the weight is different, one pound versus two pounds, any 
any change on that label has to be approved by your certifier. So you can't just have, you know, the walnut label uh, at a half a pound. It, then you got your 1.25 pound bag. That label has to be approved also. Anything that you're um, putting on anything to sell. Okay, so your OSP is a document that includes, and we kind of talked about this, in detail, all the practices implemented to follow your organic guidelines and regulations. Usually, um, so as we've been talking about this, your, certif your certifier will provide you with guidelines. So, so, so the CCUF on their website has OSP form, organic system plan, is what that means. And then you used to be, we, so you can, it has all that stuff you need to do to, to, to be, to have your plan made up. So they're going to list the requirements for you, and it's going to have a space another requirement and then a space and then your system plan basically what it is is you write in that space how you meet that requirement okay. um, and and in that all those regulations and requirements that that they want um, is going to deal with all these things we've been talking about the soil practices your labels your approved processors like where we have our walnuts processed or our prunes processed where their locations are, and all the materials that you use on your products, that they're all. Yeah, so we created a flow chart, which that, that helps me, because they want to, they, to, for them to see it in words, it doesn't help so much. But we make a flow chart, shows from the field to the market, and then where it goes and all that stuff, that helps me. Okay. Um, and then I, I wanted to make sure you guys saw this slide, because um, record keeping is very important of your applications. Okay. So um, you can use paper, you can use an Excel, you can use whatever you want, whatever is easy. But there, there are also online services out there that have software that you can use. And it's nice because, you know, this is years worth of here that you just can click and everything comes up. And all your inputs are on there um, for all of, of your applications. And also, um, interestingly enough, even if, um, you know, all your product's organic, but it has an EPA number on it, you still have to report that with your, um, your county ag advice uh, commissioner. Yeah. At least so. here in California. I'm not sure how they deal with it other places. But, and then, then this, this also, if you were going to mention it, I'm not sure. Um, it keeps track of your field operations, not just your inputs. It, it's a little more robust than just this window. And, um, but it uh, also, um, your inspector, you can give them a guest pass. So before your inspection, they can come in and look at your records. And they can't do anything to them, but they can just go in and see, okay, here's what we've been doing. And, what, and so that helps cut down their time on the farm. Yeah, so you're not paying the money for them to be going through all your paperwork. Okay, so what I'm going to end with here, almost anyway, <laughs> I wanted to show you this. Um, this is Brad when he kind of first started out with some of his watermelons. And this was his organic practice, OSP. This was in 75. My mom, before we were married, but my mom and I came up with this. It's what we take to the market, basically. So basically what I'm kind of wanting to get across to you here is this is where it started. And now what I've been telling you is what it is today and the difference that that's happened. What's it say? It says the good old days. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, re I think it's important just to see how simple it is. Oh, yeah. But it um, does cover the bases, I think. Can you read it now? So here's what it says. Um, we are a family farm operation located 70 miles north of Sacramento. We hope in our program we are able to bring a product to you with its finest potential of minerals, enzymes, and flavor. Our program of building the soil includes compost, rock dust, manure, cover crops, occasional foliar applications of kelp, and other natural elements if needed. Insect control is obtained by using beneficial insects, mechanical or physical means. However, if spraying is necessary, we use natural occurring compounds. Weeds are controlled by using mulch, mechanical, and physical cultivation. We do not use synthetic fertilizers or compounds. We have been working with commercial scale organic farming since 1975. Each year we learn new things 
and make improvement. We hope you are satisfied with our produce. If not, please let us know. We welcome any helpful suggestions. To me, that's good. That's good enough. Now we got this. So I have a couple more slides real quick, but we've kind of covered it, so I'm just going to kind of go through them just pretty quick. Some of the challenges is finding correct applications that are going to work for you. Um, this is one now that we're dealing with with the, the water, at least in California. I don't, I don't know where it is in all the other states, but the water coalition and then all that that's going on is we farm organically and we don't have runoff of vaccines in our water or anything, but we still have to get certified. We have to go to the meetings. We have to go to school. We have to do all these things and pay these fees for something that we're, we're not contributing to. Hope they're hearing me <laughs> anyway. Um, so market requirements are always changing and requiring more documentation. And that would be maybe one of the big things. I know this was um, of why maybe you want to, um, if, if you're thinking of farming and growing in that kind of aspect of selling to markets, more of your wholesale markets or that kind of line, retail, things like that, is that they're requiring that before they're going to buy it from you and they actually will send you a list of requirements that you need to fill out. Yeah, it, it can go beyond just the certifying process. They're getting at the more social net, social aspect. How you how do you treat your labor? How do you treat your bees? Some of those things are even more extensive in some of these places that are wanting to know and, and label rating you in terms of scale of what kind of farm you are. Anyway, just a note there to think of. And then, and then of course, you know, it's a little more challenging with your weed and pest control and disease control. Inputs are, uh, cost is higher um, than your conventional things. And so, um, as I told you before, there's like nearly 80 agents out there. You can kind of research. Some might fit your needs better than Others, I know some are a little more on the biodiversity favorable rather than just following regulations of, you know, USDA, things like that, um, and who you can work with, which ones are in your area. So anyway, that kind of concludes our presentation. I don't know if you have any more questions or not, but I hope it was a little helpful to you. You know, it depends on how much you grow. Uh, you're charged by your income from it. So At least in our case. We don't know about other agencies. Yeah, for our agency, that's what it is. So, you know, it's, it's a hefty price. I'll just tell you, you know, we, we probably pay about 1200 a year. Just for, yeah. That, that, does that cover, that doesn't cover our inspector? That doesn't cover our inspector. That doesn't cover the state. Okay. Now, Could they possibly. also are... They also um, have worked with the state where, where you can get reimbursed. You can get a reimbursement instead of a reimbursement program. So there, there is ways to maybe get some of your money back. Would the profit you make from having that label cover, cover as well at one point? Yeah, it does. I mean, it's benefited us highly when we were highly into the produce wholesale business, definitely. Because you just wouldn't even have a chance right. of you know, selling your product otherwise. Us personally, partly from our age, partly from all of this, we're honing down. We're we're kinda doing our own thing and you know, we're not doing as much wholesale, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it, it's, you know, I think it's something that we all think about. I do, you know, a lot, even, even in choices I make, like, I don't know, you saw my horse up there. I like horses, you know, but I'm like, you know, in the end of time, what am I going to do with my horses? You know, should I find homes for them? You know, things like that. I think, I think the Lord can speak to us and I think he promises that he will, you know, guide us into 
expanding or not, you know, things like that. And I think as long as we're not going against, you know, God's guidelines, I think, you know, it's okay to some extent. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much. I hope that was some good information for you and that you learned something.